I do believe science is becoming more spiritual because people are starting to realize that you can't compartmentalize knowledge. Sometimes you need art to understand math. Sometimes you need music to understand quantum physics. You know, and if you look back in time, many scientists were also artists or musicians, you know. Polymath. Yeah. Richard Feynman was a, a musician. I think he played the, the piano. Albert Einstein played the, I think, violin. Sarah, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited for today's conversation. Same, likewise. I have to ask, given the introductions, that you read about 20 books a month during the pandemic. And do you feel like is there a such thing as reading too much? Honestly, it depends on the person. But yes, there is such a thing as reading too much. Because at some point in my life, uh, I became somewhat addicted to reading. So I wasn't viewing it as a refuge or as a, it was more like a, an escapism for me. So I started reading voraciously and just jumping from book to book to book. And this one time, because I had my own bookkeeper back in Beirut, and I went to him and I sat with him. Usually our uh, sort of gatherings were hours on end. And I was expressing how I was sort of somewhat like constantly drawn to reading, constantly drawn to going back home to picking up that book on my bookshelf or my bedside so I can get back to reading. I'd be sitting with a person and thinking about going back home to finish my book. And I was like, nothing interests me outside of literature anymore. Like I'm not finding passion and going out. And I was a very like extroverted person. And then he was like, this is when reading becomes counterproductive. Like you're reading all this information, you're learning all of the, you're communing with the writers from the past. And what's the point? If you're not out socializing, uh, contributing what you're learning from these books and, you know, living your life, applying what you're reading to your personal life, then what is the point? And for some reason, my mom used to tell me that a lot. My friends used to tell me that a lot. But when it came from Adib, it stuck. My bookkeeper, Adib. It stuck and it just, it sh I changed overnight. So there's this idea that through reading, you get to befriend all the people who are dead the greatest thinkers, philosophers, and writers from the past. Yeah. And you almost transcend this path, like space and time tenets, right? Yeah. At the same time, you talked about escapism. So I must ask, what are you escaping from? I guess the trivialities of daily life, perhaps, or the stresses of daily life, you know, work, um, that sort of stuff. And maybe sometimes when I'm going through something, at the moment, I'm not escaping from anything. At the moment, I'm very happy. I'm very content with my life. But at that point, when I was reading voraciously, I was going through my first heartbreak ever. And I was surprised as to how, because no one prepares you for this. No one prepares you for a heartbreak, for example, in school or uh, even in, in your own uh, household. No one tells you how excruciatingly painful heartbreak is. Like you feel like your blood vessels in your heart are not fun functioning anymore. So I was shocked and I was confused and I was like, is this normal? This is what heartbreak is? Does everyone experience this at some point in their life? And uh, that's how I escaped into books. And that's when I was reading 12 hours a day, 11 hours a day. Like, I kid you not, I would finish, for example, a book like War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. And then I would pick up Les Miserables by Victor Hugo on this very same spot. So it was addictive. It was unhealthy. It was toxic. It was toxic reading. I think addiction looks different for everyone. Some people are addicted to substances. Some people are addicted to working out. Like I'm addicted to working out. I woke up at five this morning to work out before this. And of course, not all addictions are the same, but I think addictions are often manifestations of something deeper. Definitely. And how do you then retain and integrate the things you learned? Because it sounds like there is no intervals between the book you finish until the next book and adventure you embark on. So it depends on the book. Sometimes I feel like I need to take a space because I was so deeply impacted by a certain book I was reading. The last book off the top of my mind that had a mark on me like that was Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake, which is about like fungi and uh, the interconnectedness of the underground world underneath trees and fungi and plants. The book's crazy. You've read it. Uh -huh. Oh my God, what a read. That left such an impact on me that I was like, okay, you know what? I need to take a step back just so I can let the information marinate. Like I didn't, I wanted to give the book the respect it deserved. Usually I'm just like rummaging through my TBR pile, you know, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to take a break after this. That sounds like that it depends on the level of books and the impact. 
it determines your amount of time it takes for you to integrate and sip on the food knowledge? Basically, and what helps is I try, because I read multiple books at the same time. So I try, for example, if I'm dabbling with a philosophy book, I try also to read a light novella and then perhaps read something about quantum physics or something about uh, consciousness or wildlife or what have you. So I try to variate my my uh, current reading list this way if i'm not in the mood like because philosophy is heavy you know so i finish it maybe three chapters i read maybe 50 pages to 100 pages and then i'm like okay i'm in the mood for i still feel like reading i haven't satisfied that that thirst to read so i just move on to a different genre maybe romantic uh, novel erotica whatever but i just change the genre of the book to keep it light it's like different appetizers different uh-huh. flavors different uh, yeah francis bacon says that some books are to be tasted other books are to be chewed and swallowed and some books few books are meant to be digested so i try to have one to chew one to swallow one to digest i butchered the quote by the way it's <laughs> but yeah. along those lines yeah i'm reading this book called an immense world by ed young it's like a really Im- like really, really dense book about biology, umwelt, which is a reality of organisms and species. And it's a really dense biology book. And it's definitely sounds a book that I'm sipping on because it's so heavy. But you brought up philosophy, so let's go down that train. So your TikTok is very educational. It's not about you dancing. It's about you sipping on some of these important and heavy topics. Some are head heavy, some are not. And one of your videos, you talked about philosophy is a love of wisdom, if I literally translate it. Can you elaborate more about the video and just your perspective on whether philosophy is just mental masturbations or if there's actual practical usage of philosophy in life? So I think philosophy is fairly simple, actually. I think philosophy is simply possessing a faculty of wonder. So it's finding meaning in the world. It's not necessarily rooted to natural sciences or mythology But it's just finding meaning in all of these things and questioning uh, the universe, questioning life, asking yourself deep, profound questions that have no answers. So philosophy is about the questions. It's about learning why you're here. What's your purpose in life? What is consciousness? And uh, just finding uh, all these sort of links between the natural sciences. I think Tony Robbins said better questions lead to better answers in life. So why do you think asking important or meaningful questions is important? And why does it improve one's quality of life? So again, that falls back on the person. Because I know some people who are simply not interested in in learning about their purpose or in finding their ikigai, the Japanese term for your, what gives you fulfillment in life. Some people are simply here to, you know, take it day by day and uh, not necessarily survive, but just take it day by day. Others are, have this, unquenchable thirst and curiosity for knowledge and uh, where they come from and just knowing you know the uh, the roots of things looking beyond the surface the surface level and i think for me obviously i'm from the latter because i'm constantly asking questions and not necessarily finding the answer to and this is something that has f- frustrated me immensely especially in the past months because I've been asking these questions, like, for example, off the top of my head, what is consciousness? And the more I delve and the more I dive into these works of these profound thinkers, like I'm not like all the way back to Greek philosophy, to uh, existentialism, postmodernism, no one has an answer. No one has an answer to these questions. Or if you ask if the universe is infinite. Or what uh, it, it is the the fabric of the universe? No one has the answer. It's just speculation. Everything is an approximation. I think the best context or definition I heard about consciousness, it's undefinable because it's an emerging phenomenon. Because it's like layers and layers and layers of complexity, mm-hmm. and through emerging interactions, new yes. things emerge. Yes. So how can you define something that's ever expansive? Yeah, but that's the thing. Is it an emergent property? Or is it something, is it a fundamental uh, part of nature? That's the ultimate question. And it's funny, I'm reading a book right now, it's called um, Relativity or Quantum Relativity. And uh, he says that uh, discovery 
is more like having a big box, a shoe box. And you have holes in the side of the box and you're throwing in balls. And you first you throw a very large ball and you shake the box. You shake the box <laughs> and the ball travels around. And we have no idea what's inside this box, what it looks like, how expansive it is. We have no idea. But we're just shaking the box and we're getting a feel of what's inside the box by the movement of this ball. It's a round ball. And then the more we discover and the smaller the balls get that we throw inside this box and the more we shake it, the more we feel like, okay, no, then E equals MC squared means this and the speed of light is this. And we start to discover all these uh, physical constants that make up the universe. And we're like, okay, we understand the universe a bit better. We don't completely understand it because we will never be able to open this box. We're always going to have to shake the box and throw in smaller and smaller and smaller balls. And perhaps the small ball eventually becomes big again because progress is not linear. And we learn something new that demolishes a previous school of thought. And then we throw a different ball. And then, but the box will never open. And when he used that analogy, as I was reading the book, I literally put the book down and I was like, oh my God, we will never open the box. The box, this, this metaphor for the universe, for this huge question mark, we will never open it. It's ineffably unanswerable. And we just have to make our peace with that. I think a great Christian philosopher talked about one of the biggest characteristics of God is the unknowability. Because the moment you know what God is or who God is, God loses his essence. Mm -hmm. So you have to think about God is unknowable by default. That's what makes it God. Yeah. Whatever that means. It's and intrinsic. People call it the universe, the mm -hmm. source, the cosmos. The grand architect. Yeah. That's so my favorite one. That's interesting. And at the same time, if the box can be opened, then what's keeping all these scientists and great thinkers moving forward? Mm -hmm. And I had an interview with the one of the 125 exorcists in mm -hmm. America designated by Roman Catholic Church. The episode's releasing in a bit. And he talks about the reason why humans can't know about the angelic creatures, whether you believe it or not, because we're 3D creatures. Yes. And they're 4D. Yes, and so, 5D. And you can't fathom and conceptualize 4D from a 3D perspective. It's intrinsically impossible. Yes. And I see some through lines there. Totally agree, yeah. They can interact with us in their own way because they're in, in a higher dimension. But because we're 3D, we cannot go up to 4D, 5D, unless, you know, you're a Buddhist monk and spend your life meditating, meditating and trying to alter your dimension. But even then, I mean, we are very, th animals are 2D. We're 3D because we have a higher consciousness. And uh, yeah, I didn't think I would be talking about this because uh, when I, I, I'm very selective with who I open this topic with, because I mean, most people are like, what? No way. Like beings in the fourth dimension. What are you talking about? It's, 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 we are, we live in such a materialistic, empiricist world, you know, science, the scientific method, everything is so tangible. Mm. We don't believe in anything that's subtle, you know? And we have thinkers now and then like Carl Jung, you know, that try to shake the paradigm of thinking, but they don't succeed. Why? Because we're so set on our conventional way of thinking and perceiving the world around us. Because it's scary. The unknown is scary, and that's why pattern recognition works, because how can we Erico predict the future based on the data sets of the past? But the past literally means unprecedented. So if you're using the past to predict the future, you're going to fail. So I have to ask Sarah, yes. because you talked about you're frustrated often because you're thinking about what's the consciousness, the purpose of life, yeah. and so on. How do you balance the art of consuming and creating, especially your TikTok mm -hmm. channel is very educational. You try to tackle a lot of important and heady topics. So like, when is it enough? How do you battle this internal, incessant, never-ending desire to seek you? It's never enough. And that's why I, <laughs> I was telling my friend yesterday, we went on a road trip to, to Big Sur, and uh, I was like, sometimes I just wish there was a button here that I could just... Pfft, Stop thinking. Stop seeking. Like, just stop. Just start being. And I'm a very meditative person. Like, I'm a spiritual person. I like to think. And uh, I like to, I, I have to put conscious effort to be present. It's not something that's natural to me yet. But I have to put conscious effort to be like, you're here now. You're alive. This is you. You know, thud, thud, thud. Your heart is beating. You're alive. I have to constantly remind myself like stop going to the past and stop fluctuating to the future these are 
non-existent realms at the moment. You are here right now. So, and yet I'm just constantly, it's like a whirlpool <laughs> of thought that leads to another thought, that leads to another chain of thought. I went to Hawaii last week. On the plane, I was uh, having some thought experiments. And I was like, I need to write this down. So I grabbed my <laughs> the waste basket from in front of me and I wrote down my first thought experiment. And then I, it, I filled it all up. And then I, the person sitting next to me was like, hey, can I borrow your, your waste basket? It's like a paper, the white paper mm -hmm. bag. And I wrote another one. And then I wrote, I had like five thought experiments on the plane. And then, when I, and then I was, I, as I arrived back to Los Angeles on my way back, I was like, okay, so I have all these thought experiments that one of them, for example, was um, about physical constants. You know, like, for example, E equals MC squared the, the, from Einstein's theory of relativity. So C, the speed of light is a certain number, right? Does it fluctuate based on, like, based on the context, based on, is, is it only present in our universe or is it something that can be applied to a different universe? Or, like, do the laws of nature of our universe apply to other universes or is it something that changes, you know? So then I'm like, okay, so I have this question. Who's going to answer it for me? <laughs> who, can, who, who can answer this question for me? As much research as I do, you know how Socrates says, the more we know, the, the more we learn, the more we know nothing. Yeah. It's, that's what I mean when it's so frustrating. And uh, now the fact that I've become a more spiritual person has really relieved a lot of the frustration I feel from science. So it's a good balance. So in one of your TikTok videos, you talked about, or someone commented about the fact that spirituality and science are closer than what a lot of people think. Yeah. Any thoughts on that comment? I think now there is a, the gap between science and spirituality is somewhat bridging because uh, there are many scientists, they don't come to light because, you know, there's a lot of, scientists care a lot about their reputation. So if you see a scientist talking about 2D, 3D, 4D, angelic beings, you know, there's a possibility that they lose their tenure or they're not going to be respected in the scientific, quote unquote, scientific academic community. So they're very low key. And then a few scientists pop out and say, oh, yeah, by the way, I, I believe uh, consciousness is something that emanates from the physical body, you know, which is something that is not very, it's not a common thought to think. So I do believe science is becoming more spiritual because people are starting to realize that you can't compartmentalize knowledge. Sometimes you need art to understand math. Sometimes you need music to understand quantum physics. You know, and if you look back in time, many scientists were also artists or musicians, you know. Polymath. Yeah. Richard Feynman was a, a musician. I think he played the, the piano. Albert Einstein played the, I think, violin. That's a perfect segue into this very heady question uh -oh. i would love for you to elaborate uh -oh. not that we're already not being heady enough <laughs> so one of my favorite research that i came across for this interview is the divine essence and golden ratio which were utilized by men's of geniuses like da vinci and others in arts and mathematics even in melt water molecules yes what are they and why are they so significant because of the intersection between art and science so the golden ratio the golden mean, the Fibonacci sequence, the Fibonacci numbers. I think it's the language of the universe, the known universe, the universe that we live in. And uh, I think many of the thinkers, not I think, I've heard people say this, but many of past thinkers like Leonardo da Vinci and the Vitruvian man, for example, he used Fibonacci numbers. Fibonacci numbers are in all signs of life. There's a physicist actually who proved that in order to find out if there's organic substances in a solar system or on a planet is just to search for Fibonacci numbers. That's how, that's how you know that there's a possibility for life. So I think it's, it's sort of comprises the fabric of existence. I can't go much into much more detail than that because honestly, it's a, a, uh, a blurry topic to me. I'm not an expert in it, but I understand the basics. But I do believe that the greatest thinkers have used the Fibonacci sequence in their works from the Great Pyramid of Giza to uh, these uh, very renowned archaeological sites to Leonardo da Vinci to all these great thinkers. So when you come across like the thought experiments on the airplane mm -hmm. or some of these questions you ponder in life, since a lot of your TikTok content is thought experiments mm -hmm. and it comes to fruition, 
does coming up with these questions and pondering does that give you more peace or does that give you more like restlessness and makes you want to seek more in terms of curiosity because the theme of everything your way of life comes down to curiosity sounds mm-hmm. like. a little of both i feel like tiktok has been such a healthy productive avenue for me <laughs> because i'm making other people as angsty as me <laughs> I'm making more people want to be curious about like for example whether math whether we discover mathematics or whether mathematics is a fundamental part of reality for example it's a, a person that follows me asked me that question on one of my posts is math how we did we discover math or was math there to begin with in other words do we use math as a language to understand the world around us or is math a part a fundamental part of nature and i when he asked me that question i was like whoa <laughs> i literally I, i asked most of the people i know that i regard as as very like intelligent intellectual and i took their answers and then i formulated my own opinion then i did some reading uh and uh i still didn't come up with an answer so i asked my tiktok followers all of them i was like what do you guys think and each answer was just so different it was just it's just so different some were like no math is inherent to nature others were like no math is a social construct is a is a mental construct and i was like okay great now we're all confused <laughs> even better <laughs> so yeah it's it's a very tiktok has been very healthy for me and uh, i'm surp- i was like pleasantly surprised to the number of people that are so curious because in my it's been very difficult for me to find a group of friends that uh, have that thirst for knowledge and uh, tiktok has shown me that so many people out there are so curious and so ridiculously intelligent more intelligent than me and more intelligent than many of the many people i know and it's just it's fascinating for me because when i first opened tiktok i was like oh my god what is this what am i watching you know it's just like synchronized dancing and uh, but tiktok is profound it's profound i go through my feed sometimes because you know the algorithm starts to understand you and your taste and i'm like wow this is amazing i like every single video i see on my feed i've learned so much and i've thought so much so it's wonderful i'm insulted that i wasn't one of those people that you asked that's why you couldn't formulate oh. it as a, of course <laughs> um jokes aside the one of the great qualifier that i determine what a great conversation is is when you leave with more questions than you enter that container of wow conversation. beautiful that's beautiful i agree It sounds like TikTok is a platform for you because I drew the line at TikTok mm-hmm. because I didn't have the time or the energy for TikTok to acclimate into my preferences. Yeah. I mean it takes a lot of time. I spend a lot of time on the videos I make. A lot. I'm not kidding. One video took me I did a series on the nature of time. I'm breaking it down from the history of time to how we perceive time to time on the Planck scale to time according to certain physicists and most of the ideas were inspired by Carlo Rovelli who's the uh, Italian physicist he wrote the order of time and um, it took me if i were to combine the time it took me to do all the videos i did i divided it into nine uh, 10 parts so the the nature of time part 1 part 2 part 3 and each video was like 4 to 5 minutes long but overall it took me definitely like eight hours to do <laughs> all the videos it, i spend a lot of time on tiktok or on what i post on tiktok not on on the app so what is the nature of time how much time do you have <laughs> <laughs> give some spark notes a uh, high level condensed version so according to carlo rovelli the way we perceive time is wrong so like for example on the, the time where i'm seated at is it has a different value than time where you're seated at in every point in space time is different we perceive time as chronological linear as linear because it was that concept was indoctrinated because of newtonian physics because of the science we study in school so that's we see it naturally as something that's you know passing chronologically but that's he's basically dismantling newtonian physics and saying that time is not the way we perceive it fascinating I know very little about physics and quantum physics but from my understanding please fact check me that space and time are no longer the core tenets 
of our space, even according to a lot of physicists. Mm -hmm. It's just perceptions of it. Exactly. And I, I would like to add a further word into that consciousness. Consciousness is actually um, Max, Max Wheeler. He's the physicist that took over the chair, uh, Einstein's chair in Princeton. Not Max Wheeler. I forgot his name. But he's a very important, very, uh, very special physicist. And he said that the reason why the, what's creating the universe around us is consciousness, is intention. So some physicists said that it was a bit egotistical to have that, you know, viewpoint. Um, but um, there's a lot of way to it, I think. So intentionality shapes reality? Yeah. So nothing around you is real, basically. It's only when you perceive it and how you perceive it that comes into existence. And there's a theory, actually, about the origin of life, um, like circling around that because usually like the moment you observe something it disappears right so basically particles they come into existence and they disappear for no absolute reason and then viewing them or per like perceiving them sort of cancels their existence i don't even know how to explain it it's, it's so it's profound. quantum physics right? it's quantum physics so the origin the way the universe started is these particles popping into existence and then eventually formulating something that's tangible and then eventually, you know, billions and trillions and trillions of years, it expanded into the universe as we know it. But that's how it came into existence, just things popping and disappearing, popping and disappearing. Like, I don't even know how to explain it. Isn't that sort of on a line with creationism and Christian faith? How so? So if you think about the intentionality, the faith that I uphold is Christian faith, that God created everything. Mm -hmm. And God is this higher entity that's unknowable that we talked about. And... It or God that we believe sort of had an intention to create something mm -hmm. and all the energies and matter came into perceptions and they were birthed based on perceptions and intentionality. Like so, sounds like a microcosm in a way that maybe to your belief or a lot of physicists, it's a lot of different people's intentions and ideas that came into this reality. But in Christian faith and even like Islam, right? Mm -hmm. We have this entity that created everything, yeah. which is the source of life. This is called the anthropic principle in physics, that consciousness is what's creating the reality around us. I'm trying to remember his name. It's on the tip of my tongue. It's not Max Wheeler, Jay Wheeler, something like that. But I didn't understand it. Um, I didn't understand it. I tried to look at the physics behind his theory, and I tried to, you know, dissect it, and I didn't understand it. But what I did understand was that consciousness plays a profound role in the point he's in the anthropic principle. So other term that people use interchangeably with consciousness is soul. So I have a mm -hmm. segue question for you. Mm -hmm. The song of our soul, whereas Princess Diana's voice coach talks about, find our note from within. Mm -hmm. Why is it important to find the song of our soul? Because it represents you. It's something that emanates from you. It's the mark you leave on everyone you meet. And uh, he meant it, I didn't think he meant it because he was doing different like ranges of of voices and notes and showing like this is when i speak from my note it's he it's his term he calls it note to speak from your note and he meant to speak from authenticity to speak from your voice and most of us are have high-pitched voices because we're not speaking with authenticity we're speaking with all these belief systems that we've acquired over the years so it's not genuine so that's finding our note finding the soul of our soul is finding our, our authenticity so with your idiosyncrasies, belief systems, and knowledge that you consume, it's sort of on that question where do you feel like us humans are a soul with a body or a body with a soul? We're definitely, I, uh, I read this a long time ago uh, from Plato and his allegory of the cave. But I definitely, thanks to Plato, I think that we are definitely souls and our bodies are simply physical containers. And uh, he's, I remember reading, the, I read it a very long time ago and it, it resonated with me and, and everything af thereafter that I read, I would always like re revert back to the allegory of the cave because it's like, I feel like we have this, um, I don't want to say suicidal desire, but I feel like, you know how he terms eros, eros wanting to leave, wanting mm -hmm. to go back to the source wanting to dis like dispel our bodies and just like be free. So I f do feel like the human container is a bit um, 
it doesn't liberate you. I feel like you some some of us feel trapped inside, and that's why hence we feel this urge to go back to the source, to go back to maybe not all of us, but at least the people who have quote unquote awakened or seen the light. But I feel like ever since I have been, I'm not awakened. I'm not enlightened, far from it. But like ever since I've been on that path, this path of knowing that we are literally all interconnected and we are all one, I have felt this excruciating desire to dispose of my body. <laughs> it doesn't make, I don't know if it makes sense, but I just feel like I feel trapped in it. I love it. Don't get me wrong. I love living in my body and I love using my senses to perceive the r- world around me. And I love that I'm in 3D and I love that I'm in, I'm human and I love that I, I can go crazy and I can, you know, express all these emotions and feel so overwhelmed sometimes that I'm surprised my skin can even contain it. But I appreciate all that and I love to be human, but I do feel this huge urge to leave. Why? Because primarily I'm my soul. This is my soul's urge, my soul's urge to go back to the source, to to fly, to not be condemned to perceiving the world with mere senses. It's like the idea that all of us are part of the divine, or droplets of the ocean, yes. or we're not the divine in the ocean itself. And I think a lot of people get lost in that, where it becomes egotistical, egoic, where, oh, we're all gods. Mm-hmm. I think we all have gods within us, mm-hmm. but we're not the gods themselves. We're a part of God. I, or maybe God is living vicariously through us. You know, perceive maybe the, we are all God experiencing the world. That's another way to see it. I think, yeah. I mean, it's all about our perceptions, right? Mm-hmm. So, to what you just said, Sarah, it reminds me about a show I watched on Netflix called The Sinner. It's a great show. It's very psychological. And in season three, this one of the characters, he was on the roof. He wanted to jump down, but he wasn't suicidal because I think there is this inherited thrill when you're flirting with death or the idea of death. And I think all of us, when we're at a really high places, I don't want to speak for everyone, but for me, I have zero suicide risk. I'm a psychotherapist. I'm not suicidal by any means. But there are places in my time, in my life, where I always wonder, I wonder what it looks like. I wonder what if I just tipped one inch too far to the end. And it's like this idea of fear of death. That yes. Keeps us feel alive. And it's like this idea of romanticizing death as the ultimate refuge. And I was telling my best friend once, I'm like, you know what? I really just feel like just falling into a very peaceful, eternal slumber. Just, I just want to just, you know. And she was like, you mean you want to die? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no, but no. <laughs> but no, I don't want to die. I want to die, but I don't want to die. Like, I don't know how to explain it. It's, it's not something you can really put into words. I feel like it, it uh, supersedes that. It's visceral. Exactly. Does the idea of death, mortality scare you or how do you feel about your own limited mortality i'm scared for other people dying loved ones dying uh, i i actually have anxiety for, i wake up with anxiety because of this uh, i'm just scared to lose people i love i'm constantly scared to lose people i love so but my own death doesn't necessarily scare me Because especially ever since I became spiritual, and I know that death is just another doorway to something else, death doesn't scare me, no. The death of others scares me, but not my own. Why not? Because I won't be here to experience the aftermath. (laughs) But I do worry for my mom, obviously, and I worry for about the consequences of my death. But uh, it's just a doorway. Something along the lines of, uh, don't mourn my death. I am still here. I have only left the room. I am still here. Something like, it's a beautiful, it's a long poem. It's a beautiful poem. I'll try to look it up later. I think uh, I forgot his name. I'm not the best with names, but he's a Japanese philosopher, or mm-hmm. he was, and he talked about everybody dies twice. Mm-hmm. The first is the decaying of the physical body. That's the first moral death, mm-hmm. where you die, you pass away. The true death is when the last remaining person on this world no longer mo- uh, murmurs your name or remembers your name. Wow. And that's a true death where the remembrance or the lingering existence of you or who you are is forgotten by every single person. Wow. So that's the true death that he talks about. Just yesterday, I was reading uh, something written by Hannah Arendt, the writer of Origins of uh, Totalitarianism. It's not from that book. It's from, from another book of hers. But she was saying that that's how we fight death, metaphorically, is one, through procreation. 
as thinking we can leave remnants of ourselves to our kids, considering they look like us, sometimes they even act like us. And uh, second is by leaving a legacy, this obsession with leaving a mark, creating something eternal. So it's interesting that you mentioned that. I was literally reading about this yesterday. I'm in space. <laughs> what constructs? Syn synchronicity. This is synchronicity. And also, we talked about the connection between spirituality and science. And synchronicity can be explained by cognitive science. I had a conversation with cognitive psychologist, Dr. Christine Zimmer. The episode just went live, episode 122. She talks about how where you put your awareness, that's where it grows, is normalcy bias. When you drive a Prius, you notice all the Priuses every yeah. corner. When you do something new, you notice that more. And I feel like that's similar to the synchronistic ideas where because that's what you're putting your awareness, you're becoming more aware and you notice these series of events that a lot of people call coincidence and luck. Or even though I believe in chaos theory, mm -hmm. and chaos theory talks about organized chaos. And if it's organized chaos that dictates the um, tenets of the reality, nothing is really coincidental. Mm -hmm. everything because coincidence really literally means just random randomness mm -hmm. so if you believe in organized chaos or chaos theory there mm -hmm. is no true randomness do you think that the definition of uh, now we're going into semantics but do you think for example the definition of coincidence because now if you realize when you have a philosophical debate with someone you have to define each term yes like you just said coincidence what do you mean? You How do you define that? You just said chaos. You just, I think you said entropy. Like you have to define these words before, as you debate, you have to be like, what I mean by coincidence is when uh, a, a break of a pattern, for example. Maybe my definition of, of coincidence is different. So do you think that there's an intrinsic definition that applies universally to every philosophical debate? Or should you always go into semantics and explain your version of what coincidence is? And I should explain my version of coincidence. This is the reason why philosophy is one of the most hated subjects <laughs> because it sounds like mental masturbation. Yeah. But I think you have to define contextually each because mm -hmm. everything has to be contextualized. But then you can also ask, what is the context that we define each term by? Yeah. But yeah, I think, I think context does matter, mm -hmm. especially in 2023. We're overloaded with information. And, and yeah, such. definitely. So I want to take a soft pivot, Sarah, because sure. you, you brought up anxiety, that you're not fearful or anxious about your own death but you feel anxious about the death of the ones you love. Yeah. How do you view, I guess, like mental health? Because I've been having this conversation a lot with people online or offline where everything oscillates in our society. Yeah. I think 10 years ago, we struggled with withholding of emotionality, not talking about emotions, not believing in mental health. And now a lot of people believe in mental health, especially on TikTok and social media. Mm -hmm. It's all they talk about. Yeah. Because feeling the feelings is important, mm -hmm. but not everything's about feeling. Yes. And there is a difference between trauma, like the big T, like really detrimental yes. major life events, loss of your spouse, your mother, sexual assault, X, Y, and Z, yeah. versus someone that you've known for three months and they don't like you back. It's <laughs> not a trauma. It's just life. Mm -hmm. So how do you view mental health within the containers of like 2023 and the context Speaking of context. It is a trauma though. Say being ghosted by someone. That's traumatic. It's a cumulative trauma because it's all your it's being added to that first trauma. If you're being if you're ghosted by someone, say, and you're triggered and you start questioning your self-worth, the trigger was not being ghosted. The trigger was the first event that happened to you that made you question or doubt your self-worth. So you have to go back to the root, you have to pluck it and you have to solve it. So that now the current ghosting won't affect you. They ghosted me perfect. Now I can actually receive what's meant for me. So it's just this, it's, it's accumulative. But even these micro traumas, they add up. It's traumatic. It can be considered traumatic. Of course, you have different kinds of trauma. And you have the trauma that, for example, between, that happens between the ages of one to so six, or I don't know what the exact range is, but this is, this is detrimental trauma because it's embedded into your brain structure. You have to do a lot more work and maybe you might never be resolved. But the trauma that comes in adolescence and adulthood, they are still traumas, but they are more easily resolved than the traumas that occur at a very young age because it's simply changing the way you perceive things, your perception of something. Because sometimes it's not the trauma, it's how you're perceiving it. You know, I could say that I could see being ghosted as a form of rejection or I could see it as a wonderful opportunity. 
great, now I can attract who's meant for me. So it all falls back to perception. But definitely, yes, I think the mental health culture today is a bit toxic. Because sometimes I'll be going through TikTok and I keep receiving unsolicited advice. Like, for example, something recently that I've been seeing a lot of on TikTok is feminine versus masculine energy. <laughs> Woman, if you uh, have a man, don't gift him anything because you're <laughs> embodying your masculine energy. Stay within your feminine. Never let the man do this. Never do this with your man. And I'm just like, I love gifting. I love giving gifts to people I love. Like, so, okay, if I have a boyfriend and I want to gift him like... Uh, I don't know, uh, Carl Jung's, uh, the red book, the, the, the limited edition one. I'm not going to gift it because I'm going to be embodying masculine energy. <laughs> like there's this one guy who, oh my God, like sometimes I see advice on TikTok. And I'm like, oh my God, like people are listening to this and people are applying this to their life. It's sometimes it's toxic and sometimes it makes me anxious because I'm already an anxious person. And then I'll see a TikTok about, um, for example, the dynamics between men and women and how men think and uh, how women think sexually and how, for example, uh, being disloyal to your partner is inevitable and like stuff like that. And no, oh, but this is only a natural part of life. And it makes me more anxious. And I'm like, why am I watching this? This is, you know, it's, it's and then it's just they're taking it too far. They're taking it too far today. Because it's out of context. It's out of context. And uh, it's just everything is so relative. Everything is so subjective to the person. That's why I don't take advice from anyone. Because, of course, I ask for advice when I need it. It's important to ask for advice. But you also have to listen to that inner voice, too. Because the more you ask for advice and apply other people's advice to your uh, life and to your romantic relationships and friendships, the more that inner voice becomes like softer, softer. Eventually, it starts whispering and eventually it goes silent. And you don't have an inner voice anymore because of all this like unsolicited advice that's coming to you. Just ask yourself, ask yourself, what should I do? And then sleep on it or meditate on it. But yeah, it's, go it's, it's gone too far because people think that one, it's a one size fits all. It's not. It really isn't. I remember someone asked me on TikTok, a follower, how do I know he's the one? How do I know he's the one? And I'm like, you're asking me? <laughs> How do I know he's the one? Uh, I know I'm, I'm the farthest thing from a love guru. And um, I have so much to learn in relationships. I still think I'm a bit toxic in relationships, actually. And I, th I think I'm more conscious and I'm more emotionally intelligent, but I have a long way to go. I have a lot to heal. A heal, quote unquote. But um, I was like, I'm going to give her my opinion. And I'm going to specify that this may not apply to you. You know, this is my opinion. This is based on my experience. This is based on my past relationships, the books I've read, the movies I've watched. It, has, it may not even apply to your life. Your attachment styles, your upbringing, genetic Yes, markers. it's so subjective. It's so subjective. And people are out there just throwing advice like it's nothing. Like Oprah, you get advice, you get advice, you get advice. <laughs> it's like, please. Um, right? That, that's what we call like motivation and porn, right? incessant never-ending motivation inspiration you need more and more and more and more yes and more. yes and there's this there's this toxic culture that uh, right now it's promoting the suppression of emotions like anger sadness grief why these are these are just emotions why am i going to suppress them? why should i feel bad for for example having a moment of pessimism i'm human why why this this aggressive optimism like no be happy do this go hustle you should you know why if I feel like fe feeling sad today, why not? Why can't I just feel sad and not have to feel guilty for it? I watched an interview in, uh, with Esther Perel, and she was like, do you notice that when you're happy about something, you smile and you laugh and you show it, but when you're sad, you try to suppress your tear. And when you cry, you have to justify why you're crying. But when you laugh, you never have to justify why you laugh, but you have to justify why you cry. And I think it's ridiculous. Like just, you know, we're human at the end of the day. Yeah, Esther is great, great psychiatrist. Oh psychotherapist. my God, she's, she's so wise. wonderful, wonderful. I love her so much. So of course, as a psychotherapist myself, one thing that I talk about with clients a lot, and it's actually a core tenant of mental health, is our brains are evolutionally optimized. And there is no such thing as empty or useless emotion. Mm -hmm. Every feeling, emotions, or thoughts, even if it's intrusive thoughts, anxious thoughts, ruminations, whatever they are, 
they all serve a purpose. They all have function. So usually when a client comes to me for anxiety or GAD, general anxiety disorder, I ask them, what do you think your anxiety is serving you? What is the function of your emotion, in this case, anxiety? And they're stunts. They're like, what do you mean my anxiety serves a purpose? What do you mean the functionality of my emotions, like anxiety? I just want it to go away. It's like, yes, and it's protecting you. So the grief, the loss, the anger, the sadness you just alluded to, they all serve a purpose and a function. Oh. You have to dig deep to understand your emotions. That's how you address them. It's a message. It's your body's form of communication. Your body doesn't speak English <laughs> or <laughs> That's Arabic. Funny. That's funny. This is how your body communicates through emotions, anxiety, anger. And uh, the, when I realized this, that's when I start, I was like, okay, I'm anxious, great, I'm anxious. This means I'm a sensitive person. This means I'm a creative person. How can I put my anxiety to use? And yeah, yesterday I watched, I was going through my TikTok and uh, there was a video of Bella Hadid and she was saying that she, it was a very uh, random video about her wa waking up with puffy eyes and she was like, I'm, I'm trying to do my affirmations but I feel like an anxious wreck. And like, okay, yeah, you, you are loved. Yeah, you are this, yeah. But it doesn't feel genuine. And I was like, wow, like even the most beautiful woman in the world suffers from morning anxiety. It's so normal, it's so human. Yeah, comparison syndrome is innate to human nature and mm -hmm. all of us. You know, everyone has, it's like the idea that, I think we talked about this offline maybe a couple months ago when we hung mm -hmm. out, but you can't be inspired all the time. You can't be mindful all Impossible. the time. Impossible, impossible. You can't be awe inducing all the time impossible because if you do all loses its essence exactly mindfulness loses its purpose so you need the contrast to show the beauty definitely the, the world depends on an interplay of opposites there's an arabic pro proverb uh translated into english it's uh, all sun makes desert it can't be sunny all the time and the rain is productive this is why i hate this culture that's insinuating that rain is counterproductive and rain is unhealthy and you shouldn't. No, how am I going to enjoy the sun if, I, if it doesn't rain from time to time? As cliche as that sounds. It's very thematic because it's been raining and flooding right? in Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah, you have to remember that it's sunny, there's a lot of drought and it's like the seasonality mm -hmm. of life. If it's only sunny, it's the desert, like the proverb. Yes. But if it's only raining, then it's floods and there's no yes. life. You need both. And about anxiety, actually one time a few months ago i posted a tiktok about it because i spent two days so my anxiety comes in bouts it's like sporadic sometimes i feel anxious all day and then i don't feel anxious for a week and then suddenly i feel anxious like for two hours and then it's gone for no reason and like it's it's sporadic and there's this one time that i was feeling really really like chronically anxious like i was thinking of taking a xanax to be honest like mm -hmm. i was that anxious and then i was like you know what let me let me try everything i usually do when i feel anxious I took a bubble bath, I filled my tub with uh, Epsom salt, with magnesium flakes, with uh, the, 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 the bath bomb. I put uh, turmeric essential oil. I, I did the whole deal. I lighted candles. No roses? Know. No roses, though. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't romantic like that. But I sat in the tub. I, 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 I read somewhere that uh, your body holds balls of energy. And the salt, uh, like it diffuses these balls that are stuck in certain areas of your body or your aura. So that's why I take bubble baths from time with heavy sea salt. So I did that and I dried myself. And I'm like, okay, I still feel anxious. I still felt anxious. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go to the gym. Maybe I need to work out. Did a two hour workout, very intense workout. Sat down. And I was like, I still feel anxious. I did a meditation. Still felt anxious. I did Qigong. Still felt anxious. I did, I did everything, everything that I would usually, I made a list of all the things I usually do, like my, my healing modalities, I, dancing, uh, running, gymming, bubble bath, ti, 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 ta, ta, ta. EFT tapping, did you tap? I tapped. It worked, and then the anxiety came back. It worked for like an hour. I'm like, what's happening? Like I wasn't, I even asked for help <laughs> from the, the 4D. <laughs> oh, someone, someone's helped me take this anxiety. It felt like a, it felt like a block on my chest. And it's funny, when you ask people, like, where do you feel the anxiety? Each person has a different answer. Some of them feel here. Shoulders, stomach. Shoulders, you know. So I always feel it on my chest, like underneath my throat chakra and like here. Like, and it feels, it's, it, it, it feels like 
not something concrete, but it feels somewhat gaseous and heavy. And sometimes it's gray, sometimes it's dark blue. It has colors. And so I always address it and then I try to remove it and somehow it comes back. So that day I sat with myself. I'm like, you know what I'm going to do? Uh, I did a um, kindness meditation. Mm. I'm going to be kind to myself. And I kid you not, all I, all I did was me sitting down with myself and saying, you know what, this anxious version of myself, she's wonderful. I love this anxious version of myself. And I accept her, whatever. I'm anxious, I'm anxious. Why am I trying to get rid of the anxiety? I'm anxious, so be it. Like 30 minutes later, I didn't feel anxious anymore. <laughs> all it took was that. All it took was acceptance. All it took was me saying, I feel anxious, fine. So be it. I'm going to write it out. And it, it, it left by itself and it didn't come back for another <laughs> month, maybe. We're both thinkers archetypically. And one thing that my fiance Becky says a lot is you can't overthink through thinking. Yeah. So I love that. It's, it's interesting because like acceptance, self-love, self-compassion sounds cool. But the latest research shows that 78% of Americans show more compassion towards the others than the self. Wow. Like a really concrete way to think about this is when your friend or loved one comes to you feeling down, mm -hmm. sad, grief and the loss, whatever it is, think about how you show up to that friend. Yeah. Think about the vocab and the language mm -hmm. and the warmth that you extend to that friend. Mm -hmm. Now flip that. When you yourself is anxious and feeling down, upset, grieving or whatever, how, do, how does your inner critic show up? Yeah. A lot of times, don't think about it. Just sleep on it, work out, do X, Y, and Z. But then that's not what you tell your friends. Yeah. Your friend comes to you, you say, hey, just go work out. You'll be fine. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone says that, right? But we do that to ourselves. And what does that say about the society when we care more about other people mm -hmm. than ourselves? Yeah, I think that's something I love about my best friend that she always calls me out. Whenever I'm self-critical, like, oh, Mire, I did something so dumb or, oh my God, like, I hate myself for this. And she's like, hey, 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 what did you just say? Take it back. Rephrase what you just said. Be kind to yourself. Why are you always so kind to me? Why is your advice to me always so loving and kind? But to yourself, you, in Arabic, but you wipe the floor with yourself. Why? Mm. You know? And so she always calls me out. And thanks to her, actually, I've improved on this. I've become a lot less self-critical. And a lot more forgiving to myself. So I think all of us requires a village. Sometimes I'd say grounding and healing takes a village. Mm -hmm. Because willpower, discipline, drive, cognitive mindfulness, these are some of their variations, the genetic variations. And if not everyone has the genetic markers that we do, or cultivated practices, or the privilege of knowledge, mm -hmm. in that sense, you can rely on your friends and confidants to really stress test you. And reality check you, saying that, hey, stop wiping the floor with your body <laughs> yeah. and show up for yourself. Yeah, definitely. No, it, you need a community. Yeah. It's community so important. Having good friends, friends that are there for you, that listen, listening. It's so, it's so underrated to be a good listener, to have a friend that's a good listener, that doesn't listen to respond, listens to listen with the intent to listen, to understand. It's so important. It's really simple, but really hard. It's, yeah, it's profound. Yeah. So I want to go into, I think, a large theme throughout mm -hmm. our conversation so far, like the past hour, is like meaning making. So there's different modalities for therapy. Psychotherapy, yeah. one of them is CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, which works really well for cognitive thinkers like we are. And the root tenant of CBT or cognitive behavior therapy is meaning making. Mm -hmm. I know you and I do the thing where something happens to us, good or bad, even though I hate those words, mm -hmm. like a, a, a event that serves us or an event that doesn't serve us. We are very good at making meanings out of it. Yes. And that internalized gets to growth, learning, the pain teachers. How do you approach meaning making in your life? And why do you feel like our humans, this soul with a body, ability to create meanings to navigate this world that's comprised of unknown uncertainties. What do you think about meaning making generally? So for me, it all started with NLP. That's what, that was the spark in the, the cognitive journey, uh, neuro-linguistic programming. So it's when I read, when I went to Lebanon, I went to Lebanon a few, uh, two years ago, and I spent the summer there. And um, 
I was working remotely and I had a lot of time on my hands. So I decided to learn as much as I could in, in three months. Typical. I was like, you know what? I'm going to leave Lebanon a different person. Not a different person, just a, 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 a new and improved me. So I got my yoga certificate. I uh, uh, studied NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. And uh, I really left Lebanon a different person. Like, it opened my mind in ways I never thought imagined. Like, it was unimaginable. NLP especially because it made me realize how internal our worlds are. So the same event could happen to both of us and we could perceive it in completely different ways. And I feel like the point of learning about these neural maps, like we all have our own neural maps, is not so much to change your own, but to accept your own and to be more forgiving of another person's neural map. So now, like, for example... And this helps in, in romantic relationships because we tend to take things so personally in romantic relationships. And then we're like, okay, you know what? It's just we have different histories and we have different opinions and different backgrounds and different ideologies. So it's only normal that we perceive this differently. Before I was like, no, if he doesn't do this, it means he doesn't love me. Like it was very black and white, no gray, no nothing. But <clears throat> human beings are so complex. Like maybe he, he, maybe him doing it or 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 not doing it means he does love me, but I'm perceiving it this way and I'm set on perceiving it this way, and so there's no common ground between the two, or between. It also applies to friendships and and acquaintances and, and even professional relationships. So I feel like that uh, really just opened the doorway for me into realizing that it's just my perception. Doesn't mean it's right. Doesn't mean it's wrong. It just, it is, it is, it is what it is. It's my perception. It's not, it doesn't reflect reality. Whereas I was so like, one plus one equals two. Now one plus one equals three. <laughs> Defying physics. So I read this book called Lavology by a Christian philosopher a while ago. And he talks about how a lot of people in America, like we read the book Course of Love. Yes. That's why I don't believe in soulmates. There isn't the one, you pick one. Embrace your decision. You don't look back. Yes. Because love is a transcendent chemistry. But in the book, Loveology, he talks about Americans have this delusion, illusion, mm -hmm. distorted belief that when two broken people, because everyone's broken, yeah. and everyone's infinitely complex yeah. and nuanced, yeah. that life is going to get better. But he's like, hold up. When you add two broken people together, that's double the chaos, yes. double the unknown, double the complexity, double the uncertainties. And that's the reframe we're talking about. Yeah, two wrongs don't make a right. <laughs> I mean, double negatives makes a positive, but we're not just the statistics, we're not just math. Do you have any thoughts on what he said in that book and just your own philosophy of love on this train of relationships? The most way, I think, the best way I have evolved when it comes to romantic relationships is I truly believe in communication and comprehension. So before, I, my and this was something that was indoctrinated from all the romantic novels I read and all the movies I watched and, you know, this romantic idea, this romanticized, uh, from the romantic period even, this idea that your partner should get you, quote unquote. You shouldn't, no, if you have to phrase what you want and you have to phrase your needs, he's not the one for you, <laughs> you know? Like, it's ridiculous. So I feel like that's the most, that's how I've changed the most is now, no, like, if I want something, I'm going to say one, two, three. This is what I require in a relationship. My love language is this. I appreciate, uh, you know, words of information. I appreciate ac acts or services. I didn't like when you did this. I would prefer that you do it this way. Or not changing so much. Of course, accepting the person as they are from the get-go. But maybe like, okay, I, ap I would appreciate it if you altered this conduct or, you know, if you spoke to me more like th with this tone than that. Or understanding each other's attachment styles, even though I don't think that's everything, by the way. I think it, that's it's a theory. overplayed now, too. It's everywhere, attachment styles. And I don't even believe in attachment styles in the sense that they define you. Based on the person you're with, you embody a different attachment. I can be completely anxious with someone and completely secure with someone else. It's not, I'm not an, I don't have, I'm not labeling myself as an anxious, attached uh, person. It's just... This person brings out this in me, and that person brings out that in me. It's fluid. It's dynamic. So understanding each other, understanding basic belief systems, you know, values, goals, short-term, long-term, 
and just communicating, communicating fervently, fervently about everything. Like that's that's what has changed in my perception of relationships and not expecting the person to be perfect. Like a person is not a checklist. You know, if say, for example, like, of course you have your three, for example, your top three, these are deal breakers. Like they have to be present or the you know for a fact that the relationship's not going to succeed. For example, for me, it's curiosity. The person needs to be, I was on a date a few weeks ago and uh, I was in the, in the movie theater and I took my purse and my book fell out and I picked up my book and he didn't even ask me, what are you reading? He didn't say like, oh, by the way, what are you reading? I'm like- Was this first date? Uh, it was a second date. I took out my book and I was like, you see, I always carry a book with me for a rainy day. And I put it back in my purse and he turned and he didn't even ask me like, oh, by the way, what's the book about? I didn't see him again. <laughs> <laughs> like that's a deal breaker for me. You're not yeah. curious about what I'm reading. Yeah. You don't ask me, hey, by the way, what, are you, how, what have you been reading lately? Or, oh, by the way, what have you learned lately? Or, oh, uh, what are you working on? If this, that's it, I can't. You need to be curious. You don't need to even, like, you don't need to be necessarily super smart about something, but just be curious about the world around you, um, about philosophy, about books, about literature. Just be curious, you know? So this, this is a deal breaker for me. The person needs to be intellectual because based on past relationships, the ones that have always failed in a few months or where, like, there was a sense of boredom is when there wasn't that deeper sort of, access to like there wasn't an access to deeper conversations so that's a that's a, like a given and then another one is for example being emotionally mature so that these these two for me are they have to be there if one of them is not there i'm not gonna even pursue the person so but generally speaking not expecting that person to be perfect like say for example the person doesn't drink and you love to drink and you love to go out like for example i love reggaeton i love to go to reggaeton parties if my boyfriend doesn't like reggaeton, it doesn't mean that, oh my God, he's not the perfect one for me because my perfect partner should enjoy everything I enjoy. No, I'll find a friend that likes reggaeton. I'll go reggaeton pub hopping with my friend. I don't have to do it with my boyfriend. So it's just being realistic, I think. Just being realistic because according to Alain de Beton, the French philosopher, soulmates are not found, they're made. It's a decision you make every day. Like I, this is my partner. I accept him as he is, and I'm willing to tolerate what I don't like because it's worth it. Because all the good things, all the good qualities that he possesses compensate for that one or two or three or four uh, factors that I, I, I don't like. Because he's, there are many things in me that he's not going to like either. So it's just finding a balance and giving each other space. So standing next to each other and facing in the same direction. Just like waking up and choosing to be a good person is also a decision every single day. Definitely. People forget that, right? Definitely. And even aside from the non-negotiable about not being curious or having this entry point or access point to deeper conversations, movie is a horrible date idea. So I could have just told you then that <laughs> just the movie second, I don't know whose idea it was, but <laughs> it's not a, a container for conversations. Mm -hmm. And it's all about getting to know each other. Yeah, to anyone that's listening, Sarah is still single and make sure you, you <laughs> ask about her book if her book falls <laughs> out and make sure you uh, ha ask about some curiosity-driven conversations because I do believe that curiosity has to be the lane we live by mm -hmm. because it opens infinite amount of doorways and pathways and there is often magic that awaits on the other side. Definitely. So we're definitely coming towards the end of the conversation, Sarah. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask you a few more things on that yeah. note. So we connected over Clubhouse. You know, shout out to Clubhouse. I'm kind of surprised it's so active. There's still people it's on active? that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's still people on that platform. I'm, I'm kind of shook. But yeah, it's still active. Good for them. Even though $4 billion, you know. But I think one of the ways that we were able to solidify our friendships, like the digital friendships before we moved to LA, we met in, in person for the first time a couple months ago mm -hmm. is through books. So I want to ask you about this very vast blanket question. I'd love for you to take it where you may. Mm -hmm. So from the books that you read, the greatest thinkers, philosophers, and writers you interact with through this transcending time con of like the books, right? What are some of the most successful and define success as you see fit? Because you must contextualize what success means to you. Mm -hmm. 
What are some of the most successful or memorable success stories you know of or you read about? I would say off the top of my head, actually not because I actually have had to, you know, ruminate, but um, the writer Napoleon Hill, the one, mm. the guy who wrote Think and Grow Rich, because he spent, I think, was it 20 years of research? Long time. And to studying the greatest minds and the most successful people, and it all went down to the power of thought and the power of self-perception and being delusional, really, like knowing that you're going to succeed, having this deep-seated belief that you will be successful no matter what, not even will, not even future tense, you are successful. And it's, it's just coming, it's all falling together. And the research and the information, I love books that quote from other books, and I love books that recommend other books, and I love books that quote great thinkers, and that book, Think and Grow Rich, is filled with quotations and filled with examples and micro stories and it's so rich it's such a rich book i could read it every year so i would say napoleon hill and the people in his book like andrew carnegie and all these successful people that he mentions with the tenacity and willpower to get where they were in life from a blank slate from tabula rasa I think the modern writer that's sort of similar is like Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah, he crossed my mind too, by the way, from Outliers. Yeah, I really feel like it's how I view psychotherapy where it's just one of many avenues of healing or growth, just like reading a book. A lot of men clients are like, oh, we're just going to talk about my feelings. You're not going to change my life. Mm -hmm. You're right. I'm not here to change your life. But all of us navigate our realities based on the thoughts, and the content of our beliefs. So let's make sure your navigation is rooted in accurate information. And that's books, reading, and psychotherapy. So with that, I was asking about success stories because you recently went through a successful, monumental milestone of being sober. I know you had a sip of wine recently, <laughs> but you were able to stop your urge to have a second glass, mm -hmm. which is moderation right because nothing is in inherently bad it's about our, our application of that 100 percent. i want to end our conversations because i wasn't sure if i can weave this in but here we are mm -hmm. about the guided psychedelic therapy through psilocybin that we had mm. two months ago yeah. i believe so one of the things that you always wanted in addition to the incessant never-ending desire to seeking is feeling a little bit disconnected with a part of you yeah. That you felt a little bit lost, confused, mm -hmm. you're curious because mm -hmm. you've had a pulse on every modalities out there, mm -hmm. meditations, mindfulness, and so on. Yeah. One of the outcomes that came out was pretty powerful is sobriety. That for the first time to my understanding in your mm -hmm. life, 29 years of your life, 28. 28 years of your life, that you were able to stay sober for prolonged amount of period for the first time. Yeah. But feel free to share what you are feel comfortable sharing. Because I've been on the train of psychedelic therapy a lot recently yeah. after I left the military where I can talk about this more openly. And as you know, I was able to heal through my sexual trauma through psilocybin therapy yes. myself. And I do guided sessions intimately for a few friends mm -hmm. that I know. I would love to schedule another guided session, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> I got to check my schedule. You got to check with my uh, admin. But yeah, I would love for you to highlight and spotlight mm -hmm. some of your guided psychedelic healing outcome and what that was like for you and mm -hmm. anywhere you want to take this question. So I will mention that um, I did have a lot of epiphanies from that guided meditation. At the moment, it felt traumatizing. At the moment, it didn't feel pleasant and I kept... It, was, it wasn't my first time taking psychedelics, but definitely the biggest dose. So I kept thinking, like, why did I do this? Why did I go through with this? <laughs> and I remember being on the couch, which, by the way, you were a great moderator. You really, really alleviated a lot of the anxiety I felt. I felt like your presence, just you being there, made me feel very safe. Um, but it was just, I felt... What felt like eight hours, what felt like five minutes turned out to be eight hours or seven hours. I don't know how long I was. It was like six. Six hours. And it felt like five minutes, but it was just this huge, I felt, I felt infinity. I really felt infinity. Um, but in the form of mandalas. So I saw infinite mandalas that just kept going and going and going. And for the first time, because I feel like the concept of infinity, just like the concept of empty space, of a complete, complete vacuum. I feel like they are beyond a human conception. It's not nothing we could ever even fathom. To say that the universe is infinite 
can you can, if you're sitting down and having a thought experiment and trying to build a virtual universe it's beyond human conception so and i felt it and then i and the lines between feeling and thinking were blurred so i was like am i thinking or feeling am i being or nothing made sense and remember i kept saying that nothing makes sense nothing makes sense nothing makes sense because nothing made sense for the first three hours yeah I kept saying, and I think I was crying too, right? I was crying and saying, nothing makes sense, nothing makes sense. And then the first message I received was stop seeking. Stop seeking. Start being something along those lines. Literally stop seeking. And then the second one was something about like, you don't need alcohol, stop drinking. And that was the first thing I said, I think when I woke up from, the, from that state was, I'm not going to drink anymore. And it felt like such a, such a deep-seated decision. Because I always say, oh, this is going to be my last drink, and I end up drinking the next day. It's, a, it's literally every day, story of my life. And But when I said it, it felt so real, so concrete. I don't need alcohol. I'm not drinking anymore. I don't need it in my life. It was tough the first few weeks, but then it was normal. It became normal. And I genuinely don't need it. I don't need it. Thanks to the psychedelic experience, I had that epiphany. The end note I want to add is a lot of people now with the psychedelic renaissance air coat that we're in, mm. because society loves clinging onto something sexy, glorious, and just <laughs> forget all the nuances, right? <laughs> but as Sarah, you just said that it was deeply painful for those five hours. You were not just tearful, you were crying and you were scared, you were terrified. I was and then for the weeks followed, you were going through some like depressive episodes, yes. right? You were dealing with this emptiness. What's the point of life? But then through integration and consistency and mindfulness journaling, you're able to integrate the set insights into action, yeah. which you continue to carry and unfold. And I think that's really important because we often talk about the miracle molecule that people describe or attribute psychedelic as. Because in terms of effect size or clinical efficacy, psychedelic is unparalleled. That is true. At the same time, it requires work. And I think you embody both. That's why I wanted to conclude this conversation because I view success as having a vision that's greater than yourself and having the actions and intention to carry out that vision externally. And I think you're able to do that through the microcosm of psychedelic healing container and how you live by day to day. With that, to make this a full circle, I want to ask you the last question. Yeah is going back to the beginning of today's conversation, what is the legacy you want to impart when you are finally dancing, flirting with your own mortality by the end of your lifetime? I want to embody love. I don't want to love and be loved. I want to embody it in the cosmic sense. I want to fulfill that purpose. I believe that's our purpose. That's the purpose of humanity, love. And I want to embody it to the I'm not talking about platonic or romantic love I'm talking about the fabric of existence I want to embody it wholeheartedly great answer very heady to a very thematic with this conversation <laughs> container we're in so before I roll out the red carpet for you Sarah I want to ask you the hallmark discover more question given your curiosity the importance of that to you in your way of life way of thinking what is one domain in your life after this encompassing conversations, you feel motivated, inspired to discover more about after this interview? I would definitely like to read more about success stories because I realized that I haven't done that in a while. To find inspiration from people who have made it. And um, to listen to more podcasts. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a podcast. I don't, I'm not so much of a podcast person. You know, I'm more of a reading, you know, audiobooks person. But, uh, but yeah, the I, I don't. There's not a topic that we didn't breach in the past uh, hour, two hours. So it's really delving into, like delving and digging much deeper into a person's uh, sort of thinking modalities, and like it's very personal. And I was telling my friend yesterday, I'm like, I hope he doesn't ask me something too personal. And then he was like, Why? I'm like, I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to say something and regret it. And then he said, so what? And surprisingly enough, you posed very much intellectual conversations, right? But they are actually quite personal. 
they say more about me than if I were to formulate an opinion. The the way I would answer the intellectual questions that you pose, they're very personal. Yeah, during the attachment segment, I thought about asking about your situation with your dad. Mm -hmm. That's very special and dear to your heart. Mm -hmm. But I think um, I'm, this is not a gotcha moment. It's not a gotcha show. I just want to have a conversation I feel called to and gravitate towards. Yeah. And it's unscripted. So um, with that being said, this is why I roll out the red carpet for you, Sarah. Where can people connect with you? Check out the content, the educational platform you created through TikTok. Because I've never heard anyone says TikTok has been so educational and profound. Surprisingly uh, so, yeah. Until you. And, uh, and that's such a beautiful way to, you know, because you are the first in-person guest mm -hmm. during the next era and the next chapter of the Discover yeah. More journey. And I'm currently writing a book. I will publish it hopefully by the end of this year or next year. For TikTok, it's uh, Sara Hadir 3. And for Instagram, it's editor Sara Hadir. Awesome. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate your thoughtful responses, your authentic version that you try to carry in this show and outside of this show. And yeah, I had a lot of fun today. My head is hurting from all the headiness. We yeah. talked about that. <laughs> this is a great, great stimulating <laughs> conversation for me. Yeah, it was wonderful. Yeah. Definitely taking a nap after this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, to all the listeners, and if you're watching on YouTube, I hope that you can share this episode with one friend because that's the best way to keep growing this show and inspire me to keep bringing on fascinating and authentic humans that live with integrity. And if you're listening to this on audio platform, please hit that subscribe and uh, leave a review if this conversation resonated with you in a, any sense. And as always, I'll include all of Sarah's information in the show notes below. And as always, I appreciate you for your attention because attention is the rarest commodity in 2023. And until... Two weeks during the next week's train of Discover More. Thank you for tuning in.